Welcome to the True Blood, the first True Blood panel here at DragonCon 2011. I'd like to say thank you to Derek Tatum, director of the Dark Fantasy Track, and Netherworld Haunted House for helping us sponsor all these great events. Our first panelist, she's the author of the Agatha-nominated Aurora T. Martin series of mystery novels. She's also written the Lily Bard series, the Harper Connolly books, and of course, the Southern Vampire Mysteries, Give a warm welcome to Charlene Harris. She's been on TV shows such as The Secret Life of the American Teenager, Hidden Hills, that's life. For a while, she was best known as Manhands on Seinfeld, but now everyone knows her as Pam. Please welcome Kristen Bauer Van Stratton. Thompson in Spider-Man, he's been on ER, How I Met Your Mother, One Tree Hill, and now he plays a werewolf named Al Seed. NCIS and Supernatural. He was in the recent film Battle Los Angeles and he currently plays Floyd Fortenberry. Please welcome Jim Carrey. this season. Uh, we've really had a, a lot of big surprises this season. The last one was, of course, when we found out Marty was the one in control of what's going on there. I know you can't give any specifics, but can we expect any more really big surprises in the last couple of episodes? You said that you're writing 
writing process, you're very much a seat of the pants kind of writer. You, you don't plan things out very much. You just kind of go with what's going on and try different things and scenes and see what works. But on the other hand, you also said you've got a pretty good idea of how the series ends. So how do you reconcile those two approaches? Well, uh, I see the series books two through twelve as a big detour. <laughs> um, I've always known how the series would end. But it was the getting there that was the fun. Uh, and I think I'm about to I'm about to get to the end of the road and, and arrive at the ending I don't always envision. <laughs> For the cast, what have been some of your favorite moments this season with all the changes that have been going on? Uh, I've enjoyed seeing a different side of Eric, I, you know. Oh really? It's been it's been it's been nice it's been nice to see uh, you know you always got this sense that that was a complex character but there was only so much that could be revealed and to give him that opportunity. Our writers are great; they give people opportunities to reveal a lot. Um, so to get to see him him bring that out, this thing that maybe there was some suspicion about him having. Um, I, I I like the show, you know. I just I watch it. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it in watching, so. Well, I, I'd like to piggyback Jim's sentiment on uh, things being revealed with Eric. Um, one of my favorite moments this season was the scene at the lake in episode four. <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> Yeah, that was really cute. I love that. Sookie's so like, would you guys stop? Stop making that sound. You know, just holding like, these two guys like it's nothing. Um, well, I mean, you guys mentioned other actors, and I was going to mention myself. <laughs> now I look really, you know, narcissistic. But I, I really, you know, doing that whole rotting face storyline <laughs> was super fun. <laughs> I mean, it was long hours, and it's uncomfortable, and I was blind in one eye, so all of that stuff was a thing. But I enjoy that process, you know, I, I love watching them figure out how to create that. And um, I love playing, you know, that Pam was her most raw and, you know, warrior-like this year, because mm. in, in years past, I'd seen all the other you know, like I, Alex ripped apart bodies like in the opener for season two, and I was like, you're so lucky, you know. <laughs> I want to rip apart bodies, and then, you know, so there's sort of this checklist I have, like my flashback, you know, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to get that. So that was pretty fun. And you guys are good. Huh. <laughs> well, what I was going to say, you know, I, what I love about the show is that, yeah, it's vampires and werewolves and fairies and witches, but... <laughs> It's really about being human, and I, and I find the show to be so true emotionally. And, um, you know, I was just going to give Jim some props because I think his scenes uh, between, you know, those breakups with Jessica are like, I just sat there going, yeah. But I sat there going, like, this is every horrible breakup I've ever had. <laughs> In two minutes, and it was almost like two yeah. months to handle. That's the great writing, and that's what you're saying. You get to reveal your character in the most interesting way. And I think, you know, with, without knowing much about the other vampire programs or whatever, I would guess that's maybe what distinguishes the show. Right. Is that it's, it's not just a genre. Um, these people are writers who are in touch with their own humanity and they're alert to what's going on in the world, and, and they incorporate something as far out as what Miss Harris came up with with the, with the vampires and then they make it right at home and very human and relatable and if you guys couldn't relate to it at some point the spectacle of it would wear off I imagine so that is an amazing thing that Charlene did that's why I laugh because it's like well you know there's fairies and vampires and witches and were panthers and, and you know it's like, <laughs> like it's like you know and she just made that work which is kind of amazing they all look inside my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, when, sorry. When, when people ask me, well, where is Alcee? Where is Aaron? You know, I'm, where's Boyd? I'm just, I'm going, they live here. <laughs> <laughs> they don't live out, out in 
the real world. So if you came to my house, please don't. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't see them hanging around in my front yard having a margarita. <laughs> Shirley, what do you think of season four? Oh my gosh, it's like they, they took my book uh, and gave it steroids. <laughs>
Clearly that pack is no threat to this man. <laughs> but he understands it's better storytelling to be torn like that, and you can see it in his eyes and the way he does it. It's just, uh, we have an awesome cast of people making, making a big choice. Like that. Thank you. Because I haven't experienced that before. And, you know, where they cast you, send you the script. I mean, to the point where it says in there, in parentheses, will be in Swedish, above my line. <laughs> and I'm like, oh! And nobody calls to help me or offer me a voice coach. They're like, she'll just speak Swedish on a day. <laughs> you know? I mean, we get so much room. And kind of show up and the directors and everyone just say, all right, well, let's do it. And then they come out and, you know, but dial it up or down. Like, they're kind of the volume of the directors for us, for me. But, you know, it's incredible to have that much freedom and space. And for Pam, in answering the question of how much do I add or contribute, you know, really I feel like, oh my God, that's so good on the page. I mean, it comes to me really good, which is also unique. I've had a lot of things come to me on other shows where I go, oh my God, I do not know how I'm going to make that work. And I used to have a rule where I would just put food in my mouth and be eating when I couldn't make a line work, but I can't do that for Pam. <laughs> but I haven't had to do that. So um, I just feel I have this huge, like, right? You can, you can just, like, drain some random words into a random Every single Pam is really changing. She seems to be becoming more dark, more feral, more uncontrolled. What do you think about that? Oh, I hope that's true. I, <laughs> that's the vision that I had in my head. I, I would read it and go, oh, I want her dark and feral. And, and then, you know, you're five hours in the makeup chair. And you kind of go into a coma. And then you wait three hours. And then they call you for your scene at 3 a.m. And by 3 a.m., I don't care. <laughs> you know, and I'm trying to get myself to care. I'm like, come on, you know, sort of in my head. Come on, soldier, whack, you know. <laughs> Fuck up, Missy. And then I do the scene, and I'm really just having that image in my head of, you know, just nasty and vicious. And, and then I'm driving home, and the sun's coming up, and I'm thinking, oh, I hope I was vicious and nasty. <laughs> piggybacking what, what Jim was saying, you know, um, you know, I think one of the real strengths of the show and, and something that's really extraordinary about it to me is that you, you have these preconceived notions about these archetypes and when you get to the show and you watch the show, uh, Alan is very smart about bending that perception, you know. Uh, you get a character like Lafayette that shows up with this dangly feather earring and blue eyeshadow, but he's, you know, beating the shit out of everybody, you know, at the bar. And you're like, wow, that's completely not what I expected, you know? And then you get, you know, you get a vampire in this package. Mm. And she's the most vicious, bloodthirsty one on the show, you know? And, you know, and you get a werewolf where you have, you know, I had a preconceived notion of what a werewolf is. But you get there and he's, he's really sensitive. <laughs> Loyal, and he's got this big heart, and, and, and that's what's so great about it is finding those moments. Because listen, man, you know, I've talked to Charlene about the books and kind of his arc through it. The monster's there, and he's going to be there. But we don't need to get to that just yet. Oh, man. Man. Charlene, you as the writer have this strong mental image of all the characters and what they look like. When you watch it on screen and see these actors doing such a great portrayal, does that in any way affect your own mental image of the characters? I, I try not to let it do so, uh, though of course that's very tempting, but I've lived with the characters for a very long time now, and uh, I have a, a mental picture 
of, of what they look like, a very strong mental picture. And you can't match that in human terms. These are my fictional constructs in my head. Uh, that having been said, uh, some of the actors on the show are very, very close uh, to the ones, to the way they're, uh, to the way they are in my head. Uh, not all of them, but it's amazing seeing my characters reinterpreted, uh, not only in the show, but in the, uh, the audio book. Uh, when they're read, they're so different. I'm Suki always sounds so much angry <laughs> in the audio books and in the show than she ever did in my head. And I'm going, am I right and mad and I just don't know? <laughs> I think, what, am I, what feedback is that giving me? So it's, it's kind of it's a complex process, really, to see people do your character uh, and to, uh, to think, did I really write them? Is Alan seeing the heart of what I wrote? Or is he just going off on his own? And Joe, you were watching the show before you were actually on it. How do you go to a show and just say, you know, I think I'd be perfect for the part of Alan Cena and then get that part? Well, I have to thank the fans. <laughs> Seriously, uh, the fans of the books. Um, there were they were blogging online and kind of you know fantasy casting all of the characters who showed up throughout the books, and uh, I think this is this was right after season one ended, so you know only really vampires and shapeshifters had been you know yeah. <laughs> had been uh, you know had, had shown up and um, and they were blogging about you know this this werewolf that shows up in, in book three and I thought wow you know there's, there's werewolves in this this is great I love werewolves and uh, and they were posting pictures of me saying that that, that I should play him when he shows up and uh, and so I got the books and I read up on you know and I, I read the first scene where where Sookie opens the door and it says she looks up and has to look up again <laughs> and there's this giant dark haired uh, you know olive skin guy whose biceps were the size of boulders that she did the pull up on. And, uh, and he worked with a, at a construction company and I'm like, I used to work construction. <laughs> um, so it was really interesting, um, you know, to me to, to read that description and go, man, maybe this could happen. And so I started bugging my managers and agents and I got in there and um, and from what I understand, uh, you know, they brought me in to read for Coop first because he was the first werewolf that was being cast. And I guess I came in and read for Coop. And uh, the way I understand it, I walked out of the room and Alan said, I think that's Al C. <laughs> so they think, I guess they, they stuck my picture up on the wall and there it sat for the next two weeks. And they, when, once they had the, the script for episode three done, they brought me in to read for it and they gave me the part that day. So, it really felt like the books found me and I found the show. You know, it really felt like we kind of met each other in the middle. So, um, and, I, and I'm constantly, I just want to say something, I'm constantly amazed when I go back to the books and, and dig in because somebody brought to my attention, there was a blog that wrote that Alcide is actually a derivative of the name Hercules, of, of Heracles or Hercules, uh, if you go back to Greek. And that he had this, uh, you know, that he... She, she knew that. <laughs> I mean, divine inspiration, whatever you want to call it, because, you know, there are parallels to that in the way that you play, you know, I would play the character in season three, because Alcide really felt like uh, being a werewolf was a curse, and Hercules was cursed. He was also forced to carry out his tasks. Alcide shows up, has to carry out a task. He has the bodyguard for Sookie, so. Mm. Oh, I planned on that. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty deep. Joe, what I think is interesting is Alcide is such a physical guy. You very well could have gone into professional sports, but you chose acting instead. What is it about acting that fulfills you in a way that sports didn't? My dad was not happy about that. Um, <laughs> when you grow up in western Pennsylvania and you're six foot five, two twenty in high school, you can run, throw, dunk, catch. Being sensitive and being an artist. <laughs> uh-huh. That's, that's not okay. Yeah, go steal it. 
I always jokingly say that you know my father really wanted me to be an athlete, and I always jokingly say if he would have pushed me into ballet, I'd probably be the quarterback of the Steelers right now. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know. There was just something in me from the time I was a kid. Funny enough, at the time I was a kid, I was obsessed. I would I would draw and paint monsters yeah. like all day, and read Stephen King books and. You know, even uh, Dean Koontz, uh, Watchers, you know, like, the half man, half dog. I mean, I, you know, I was, I was obsessed with these books before my dad took them away and hit them. And, uh, and, you know, the, the story goes, it's funny, I, I used to go to church every morning because I heard the nuns would say, if you pray with all your heart, God will answer you. And so I would go to church every morning as this little kid at six in the morning, and, and I would pray that God would turn me into a werewolf. <laughs> It didn't happen, and I, I became very disillusioned with the church for years. This went on. I was like a total nihilist, and just you know. And then of course I get this part, and uh, people say, "Yo, what happened right after you got the part?" I was like, "I hit my knees." It was like, "All right, I get it." Right, right. <laughs> there's always something like that in me. That's like the most concrete proof I've ever heard that there's a God. You know? <laughs>
question over there? Maybe cover that question. <laughs> Well, every time Al Seed gets kicked in the nuts, beat up, I know there's the phone call from my dad. <laughs> Dude, how the hell did he do that to you? You're, you could kill that guy. What the, you know? So it's more about that. Um, mind you, like, all the nudity that's going on with my character, I never get... Take it off. It's my day off. Come on. <laughs> um, so my dad would probably change that about Al C. But it, it looks like things are maybe heading towards a conflict at the end of this season. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I, I, you know, it just looks ham. I'm like, more, bring it on, you know. But, uh, Just think about Estonia. Uh, you know, I'm, everything that I hoped would happen has so far. Um, they were very sensitive and open to some ideas I had about the part. Um, the part originally, I think, was a bit uh, maybe going to be kind of jerky and you know, in the, in the pilot, we're talking about hanging out with the rat rays and smoking dope with them or something and and uh, we didn't I didn't know much more than that and so I had a conversation with Alan and said what if you know the reason that maybe I'm kind of uh, not so good with girls or whatever isn't that I'm some kind of asshole but just uh, very much like a child and, and, and in the beginning and what I liked about that idea is I knew that that would give us some place to go and uh, it has and, and you know I would love to just go like dark you know what I mean? Like, everybody that I've ever had, uh, I say Hoyt, uh, everybody that Hoyt has ever really had to love him is now completely betrayed and abandoned. And when that happens and you're a loving person, at some point in time you spit up that currency of love and, and what's left is usually some kind of dark matter. And I'd love, love to see you, uh, what we can do with that. Joe, you say your dad calls you up. Does that mean he's cool with the acting now? Is he cool with the acting thing? Yeah, it pays my bills all right, so he's okay. <laughs> he's all right with it now. <laughs> Miss Harris, I was wondering what made you come up with the um, Spooky Stackhouse series and from the book to the TV show? What has been your favorite character to be transformed from the book? Uh, that's the kind of a multi-layered question. Um, my career was not going anywhere, and I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I wrote a book that had everything in it that I'd always wanted to write? Mm -hmm. wow. Just everything, everything. Uh, you know, a uh, mystery, because I've been writing mysteries. Some science fiction, what about some vampires? And maybe a little sex. Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know, if I'm not gonna, if I'm never going to write a sex scene, it better be now. <laughs> Darkness and blood. Does Alan Ball get that? <laughs> yes, I think he does. Uh, 
uh, and we're both Southerners, so um, we, we get along very well, and I think it's worked out pretty good for both of us. Hi. Um, this season has featured a, a time jump, and I was wondering what all of you kind of felt that your characters were doing during that last year. And also Charlene as well. <laughs> I was working hard, I can tell you that. Uh, Deborah, Deborah and I spent a couple of days talking about that. And um, what we came up with was this idea that we really thought we were different, that everybody sort of offered these warnings to us. It can't possibly work between a, a human and a vampire. And that our love was so intense that we thought, surely they don't mean us, right? We're different. And then the year had begun to sadly prove us wrong, that there were these problems. And, um, and from there, could kind of just treat, just treat it like a relationship that was falling apart, but that I still hoped would, uh, would work out. And uh, it, was, it was fun. It was fun having that time to kind of make something up. You know, there's little clues all, all throughout, but it was, it was great fun getting together with somebody and kind of imagining what might have happened. Yeah. There was a, a throwaway line about my mother. Your mother being a better shot. Right. And I don't think that's ever been explained fully. Well what we came up with is that uh, <laughs> was that my mom and sort of, you know, kind of early on, maybe a year or so ago, had, as a last ditch effort showed up at Merlot's um, and made some kind of wild statement and took a shot at her. And from that point on, it's actually kind of crucial to what we came up with because we came up with it after that, I became so protective of her. And at first she appreciated it, but over time I became overprotective of her. And what it gave me was sort of a way to justify being this clingy type of boyfriend instead of somebody that could just love somebody, was the idea that if I wasn't close to her, something was gonna happen bad. So when you see us dancing and stuff at the club, that's when we, we came up with that was one of our first times to go out since that incident. Um, and it just gives us something underneath what's being said. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you remember that. Well, Alcide thought Slicky was dead. And, uh, and from there, um, I think he went out looking for her. Uh, and he couldn't find her. So uh, after everything that went down to Jackson, I mean, him shooting Coot in the head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they killed my Coot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uncle Coot's gonna get you. Uh, I love Grant Bowler, by the way. I was sad. You know, he's my buddy. Uh, I was sad to shoot him in the head, but he had to go. Uh, <laughs> But after, you know, killing Cooter, running over that other werewolf, um, you know, and then burying Russell, mm, he wanted to get the hell out of there, and uh, out of Jackson. And then, um, you know, this job comes up where he's, uh, you know, building this huge, you know, housing community in Shreveport. So decided to move to Shreveport. Now, during that time, Debbie, starts going to AA and uh, gets clean and gets to her, you know, her, her amends phase of her sobriety and made amends to LC. And LC kind of went, yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Just, you know, last time I saw you, you pointed a gun in my head and tried to kill me. Thank you. You know, but she would have to make amends in such a convincing manner and, and promise to change <clears throat> that, you know, I think, you know, being as loyal as he is, and also, I, I read the wolves secrete this chemical called vasopressin. Wolves have it, dogs do not. It's the mate for life chemical. Now think about that. If wolves possess that, it'd be very difficult to leave each other. Also, the female werewolf dating pool is very thin. Okay? <laughs> not a lot to choose from. Go back and watch it. Season three, they're a little rough. <laughs> so Alcee being the good guy that he is, having the heart that he does, and knowing that Sookie is dead, um, you know, takes her back, gives her another shot, 
and decides to move to Shreveport, start over, and, uh, and ask her to come with him. And she does. And then Suki shows up. <laughs> and everything goes haywire. Because I talked to the producers about this, and they, they agree with me. If Suki hadn't disappeared, Alcy would have built that house for her. <laughs> He's a sensitive werewolf. Well, you succeeded. You really did succeed at that test. Yeah. I, I applaud you. 
Work on that show. I love True Blood. Thank you. My second question is for Boy. The guy that plays with him, Carl. But anyway, um, I see your character going from this mama's boy losing his innocence into this dark character that you evolved into in third um, this season here. Um, which side would you pick if you had a chance to be either werewolf or vampire? Which side would you pick? Careful, careful. All right, so check this out. I'm not kidding. Stephen King's Cycle of the Werewolf, the illustrated edition. Yeah. I've seen it. That a movie called The Howling, when I was very young, had me not quite praying to God that I would be a werewolf, but trying to convince myself I was in case vampires came for me as a young man. <laughs> when I was in college, the RA of the dorm that I lived at called my mother and said, your son can't live here anymore. The kitchen staff thinks he is a vampire. <laughs> she wasn't kidding. Um, and, and I, I enjoyed that a lot. So, I've spent a little bit of time pretending to be both. Um, wolves are my favorite animal. I love them, man, I love them. Uh, and I like the idea of being able to die and have an afterlife, you know? So, I like the idea, I don't know, I don't know how it works, Joe. If you die, you, you die like a person dies, your soul's intact or whatever, but. Uh, you know, I don't think I'd want to be a vampire. Uh, I think I'd rather be a wolf and chew people's throats out. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me in. We've got time for one more question. This is from the Is Quinn going to be back in the books? And is he going to be back? What a timely question because the Sookie Companion just came out and Quinn is in the novella. In the city Is he going to become a character in the series on the TV show? On the TV show? And you have to ask Alan then. Uh, I hope so, because who doesn't like a great big ball guy? Uh, but of course, I think there's plenty to look at on the show already. Someone down here just said, what was your Twitter again? So I really am doing an enormous, I'm really trying to do everything I can for wolves and a few other species at the moment. But, um, so if you just Google Kristen Bauer, there's my website, kristenbauer.com. I do everything on it. I answer my Facebook people, my Twitter people, so you'll find me. But it's my last name, now that I'm married, Bauer von Stratton on Twitter. But you can find everything through my site. And um, I've got some wolf stuff to talk to you. It's a great wolf sanctuary. Alan Ball sent out an email and I contacted them and they just rescued like a hundred wolves and we can visit the sanctuary. Hey, real quick. Did you guys say hi to my wife Sierra and I can take a little video? Uh, Three, just say hi Sierra. One, two, three. <laughs> uh, and say hi Aubrey and then you can send it to Aubrey. Thank you all so much for coming out.